This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's Wednesday, the 21st of September. 21st day, September. The stars are the... Yeah, we knew we'd get shut down if we used the. I don't uh, want to go too long. The actual song, the algorithm algorithm would pick it up, and we'd be busted for copyright infringement. But after hearing that, I'm thinking we maybe mm-hmm. should have just taken the ding on the copyright infringement. Big day for DJs today. Just play that song, and you know it, all the fine. songs, hey? <laughs> are there are there other ones, uh, other dates on the calendar? Oh that... yeah, I got my crates all lined up for all the days. Ready to go. Yeah. Days <laughs> of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oilers. Oilers. Really got my buckets going when I was with them. Right. You know, you had to be the former situational official host of your Edmonton Oilers, the former official DJ of your Edmonton Oilers with you yeah. on this, unfortunately, hockey talk free edition of Real Talk. But if you do want to hear our takes on the hometown team, in particular, a PTO offered to Jake for Tannen, which I know a lot of people are talking about, you'll have to download this week's edition of Seriously with Sapria and Ryan. It's just gone out. And we're very excited about that. You can check it out at seriouslypod.com. You can subscribe to it anywhere you get your podcast. You can find it on YouTube as well. Every Wednesday, we bring you a fresh episode, guaranteed. I don't remember if it was you or Sapria that said it a couple of weeks ago, like a 90s pizza joint, guaranteed under 30, <laughs> 30 minutes. minutes or it's free. <laughs> well, whether it's less or more than 30 minutes, it's still always going to be free. But you can check out Seriously, and we encourage you to do so. We do talk about Jake Vertanen. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers, we talk about Vladimir Putin, essentially. I mean, did he, uh, I mean, not technically, it's not a serious question, but did he declare war on on the Western world last night? Uh, it may not be my serious question, but it's a serious situation. Uh, of course, the Russian president has, has sustained some losses territory-wise in their advancement, their war, their aggression in Ukraine, and certain... Uh, Russian held regions have they've been indicating there are going to be uh, votes held on those regions becoming integral parts of Russia and world leaders, including the American president, including Canada's prime minister, have said uh, basically absolutely not. This is uh, unacceptable and be treated as such. Well, now Putin has mobilized 300,000 more troops uh, for the war in Ukraine and has stated that it's not a bluff. He will use nukes and so obviously this is a story that maybe you're waking up to today this happened just hours ago it's something that's on our radar it's the type of thing that that is nerve-wracking i think for for a lot of people when you're talking about somebody like putin who's unpredictable who's not like you know the rest of uh, the world leaders that you you may see for example in attendance at the queen's funeral mixing and mingling and mm-hmm. talking about things Uh, A couple of them are at least one also singing around a piano bar. We'll get into that with our guests today in just a few moments. I'm excited to announce the return of the unofficial opposition roundtable. Now, it may not be an officially sanctioned Real Talk roundtable because it's not on a Friday, but who cares? We don't limit our panel or group discussions to the last show of every week. Erica Eiffel, Mo Amir, when they joined us last time, they had never met and their chemistry was undeniable and we loved how they were hitting issues of relevance and so we've invited them back and we're going to get into a lot of the stories that are making news today in just a few minutes with erica and mo the unofficial opposition roundtable another story john that i think uh, demands our attention and it's a story that i'm having a difficult time wrapping my mind around although it's already got me dreaming Mm. have you seen this reported out of the united states two people who no doubt we don't blame them, wish to remain anonymous, have claimed the third largest U.S. lottery jackpot win in history, $1.34 billion. 1,300 millions. 1,300 I always think million terms. dollars. You could go to virtually everybody... Pay off on your friend, homes, your you friend know. list on Facebook. You could say to all your Twitter followers, whatever, depending on your situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could literally go to every former classmate you've ever had since kindergarten and pay off 
all of their houses. Change everyone's lives. And it wouldn't even put a dent in your fortune. Give everyone $2 million and then say, don't ever call me again because I'm buying an island. Yeah, literally. Here's your one-time payout. Yeah. Because you know everyone's going to be DMing you for, oh, my oh, dad's I idea whatever. for a restaurant. I get it. I want to do this I was thing there, too, and... before I won. So here's yeah. all the money you need. Yeah. Here's 150 grand for you. Here's a million for you. I've known yep. you a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't invite me to your wedding. Here's five grand. <laughs> Bet you wish you would have splurged on a couple of chicken Kievs for me. And then just check out. It's a, just another level. You talk about winning the lottery and people that like, you see these lottery wins that are life changing and incredible. Mm-hmm. Five million dollars. Mm-hmm. Thirteen million dollars. Mm-hmm. Like once you start talking about one point three four billion, it's just an entirely different you know, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to buy 10% of like X company, like a major company. You could do whatever you wanted. You could buy, you could have a. Your money really works for you then. You're not, you know, you don't have to worry about money anymore. You invest a bit of it and it just makes you money. And I was reading about that last week, like how your first million to make is the hardest. The second million is like 30% easier. The third is like 50% easier than that. And then once you get to like three, four million, your money's working for you and you're pretty much. You just checked out. Oh. Yeah. So that's why it's been so hard to get to the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's all starting to make sense right now. Yeah. Uh, we, we can maybe take a look at this in the live chat. You know, like, what would you do if uh, you won $1.34 billion? I mean, the, the recurring answer will just be whatever I want. Mm-hmm. Freedom. It means freedom. It, but it's more It's more like like $3 million is freedom. Yeah. <laughs> $1.34 billion. Yeah. But I mean, in the sense that, like, we were talking about, like, earlier before we went on air, Conor McGregor, he just goes out there and buys yachts and Ferraris. I'd do more like, you know, take a helicopter over the pyramid. I'd be living every day. I'd be experiencing. You'd be taking everything in, you know? So You could you could ask your friends or your loved ones to come up with the absolute most wild ideas. What's the wildest idea you could possibly come up with? And then you'll say, I'll, I'll pick the one that just strikes me as most Mm-hmm. You know, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, not ostentatious. That's a negative. But but something like the most bombastic, the most bold, the most ridiculous. And we're going to do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We were we were at the Superstore last night, me and my beautiful wife, Jatinder. And there was a big, long lineup because there's like a $70 million jackpot for one of the lottos right now here in Canada. And there's just a line of people. And she's, like, staring. And I'm like, you want to get a ticket? <laughs> but... It's even harder to win when it's the bigger jackpot because more people are playing, right? So yeah, I've, I've heard the lottery described as a tax on the poor. You know, yeah, I mean, a totally. lot of people roll their eyes at people that buy lottery tickets. What are you doing with that ten bucks? People will say if you if you would just save ten bucks every single week, you know, forty <laughs> bucks every single month with the compounding interest, you know. But 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 for the one person <laughs> that wins it all, <laughs> for that one person, aren't you glad you spent? Right. The 10 bucks. But yeah, we were also talking after and we were Googling like, how much do we need to save a year to get to a million? And it was something like half of both our incomes for like 16 years or something. Yeah, so. you got to figure it out. Well, it's good to have a plan. <laughs> if there's nothing else, it's good to have a plan. Uh, you could let us know what you would do. I should drop in on this. I haven't checked in on our live chat. A big shout out to everybody that joins us live every morning, streaming live on the Mixler audio app, or of course, checking out the show on YouTube. And thanks to everybody that subscribes to our YouTube channel as well. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Megan says, yeah, she'd buy a few houses in a few different places for sure. Or you just go around on, uh, it, well, it used to be VRBO. And now if you notice, they're calling it Verbo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you could go on there. You could, you could check out like what are, or, or maybe the, the most ridiculous options aren't on services. Like you'd probably have to go to some private, uh, you know, facilitator that you're like where, you know, these big, like $50 million pads that you can rent for yeah. the week or whatever, who knows what it costs a hundred grand for the week or something like that. And like Megan says, but you could travel around the world, check them out. And then when you find the ones you really love, you know, what do you want for this? They say it's not for sale. You go, everything's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> everything's for sale for the right price. I have 1,300 millions to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy says my uncle jokes in his stand-up routine about buying red deer, kicking everyone out, <laughs> knocking it down, and rebuilding it all in Nerf. I think I need to hear that stand-up routine. Dwayne wonders how much of the fanciest Dijon ketchup could you buy with $1.34 billion? Buddy, you could mm. buy the company. Is that Grey Poupon? Tony says, I would burn every bridge at work. 
if you won one point three four billion, would you, would you give me two weeks' notice, or do you think it would I just think, be an immediate? You know, we've discussed this. I think we'd come in and just you know. We would do whatever we wanted. I mean, it's already real talk, so I don't know if it would change. Oh maybe, no, I, it would get more real. Maybe we'd have some drinks. While if you had one point three four billion and you had a podcast, people like a lot of people would be fascinated to listen to it, but a lot of people would be so turned off mm-hmm. they would have no interest. You you wouldn't be relatable anymore. It wouldn't like your real your real talk as a billionaire would be very different. Mm-hmm. You know. Like, isn't it so annoying? You get all these dividend checks every month from all your investments, and you have to, de- you have to deposit them all. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have. You'd have a staff of thirty if you had that much dough. Dwayne wonders what do Real Talk subscribers get if you win one point three four. That's a well, that's very a good fair question. question. You yeah. know what we would do? I, you have my word. We would snapshot our subscriber list that moment. I don't Pay care back. about. I don't care about the joiners after. Pay back all the Patreon. All oh, the Patreon would be paid, paid. back a hundred percent, but we would double that up. Mm. You know, there would be a nice return on your investment in this show. Thanks to everybody that supports us on Patreon. By the way, that really means a lot. Uh, we probably have our unofficial opposition members ready to rock and roll right now, so I won't, I won't take too much time. I want to let you know that we're going to get to Ron and Carolyn's emails a little bit later in the show. Carolyn, Justin and the piano. Her subject line: Ron's PM Trudeau. This is what's resonating with you. We're going to take you out to the mountains. Jasper is safe. A huge shout out to those wild firefighters and the ATCO employees that got that town powered back up, back on the grid, the tourism operators, the restaurants, the locals ready to welcome back visitors to Jasper. So we'll take you out there. It's just in time for the autumn season, which is absolutely amazing out there. Uh, I'm going to focus on a a tweet from Alberta's former justice minister. You're probably expecting to hear my thoughts. We'll get it in front of our round table as well on Casey Madu and, and the road that he's taking Uh, And of course, we want to review what you told us yesterday, your wishes for your funeral. We're talking about the, you know, the Queen's funeral, obviously, and Justin Trudeau singing. And how do you want your friends to act or behave? What do you want your friends to feel before, during or after your funeral? And we got a lot of great responses like this one from Real Talker Jennifer, who says, I prefer a celebration of life where everyone who loves me is singing karaoke renditions of the songs that remind them of me while smashing tacos and gin cocktails. That sounds like a pretty good funeral or celebration of life to me. So that's coming up on the show as well. This show doesn't happen without the support of our amazing sponsors like the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And John, fall blizzard season is here. Cozy what are we talking season. about right now? What are we talking about today? What's the one in the spotlight off the top of the show? I know my wife's going to be happy about this one. The pumpkin pie blizzard. Oh, buddy. Everybody talks about these pumpkin spice lattes. Forget about it. The pumpkin pie blizzard is the fan fave that matters. It's part of the new fall blizzard menu. They reinvent that specialty menu every season. So today's a great day to go check that out at Palisades, Nebeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. It's also a great day to get your hands on, hey, we're talking about all these life-changing wins. (laughs) How about a $2.2 million dream home covered, paid for, fully furnished as well your chance to live in life-changing luxury also means that the misericordia and gray nuns hospitals in the metro edmonton region can continue to offer top-of-the-line care for the albertans that need it the covenant foundation lottery for the last 30 years has made that care possible thanks to your support of course they're giving away trips and cash through the 50 50 and cars and a whole bunch of other great stuff you can check it out online get your tickets at covenantfoundationlottery.ca or give them a call at one 944 2774 our friends at Eden Landscaping, they're, oh, of course, they're watching the calendar. They're watching the thermometer, just like everybody else. Did you say it dipped below zero last night in our neck of the woods? I think it was one point last night I went to the bathroom. It was about minus one or two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, people are going to start covering up the plants. People are going to start bringing in some of their plants. And that means in the landscaping business... Uh, They're going to start talking to their clients about next spring, looking at your Pinterest boards, the pages you've torn out of magazines. Sometimes the permits or even the construction materials can take months to get back. So why not get the ball rolling today? Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping ready to talk to you at landscapeedmonton.ca. Our next two guests didn't know each other before they joined up on Real talk, uh, a political roundtable quickly turned into the unofficial opposition. And what a pairing it is. Erica Eiffel is an economist, a journalist who founded Not In My Color, which is an equity and anti-racism consultancy. 
Uh, she's the co-founder and co-host of the Bad and Bitchy podcast, which you have to subscribe to. Critical analysis on uh, politics and pop culture from an intersectional feminist perspective. And you may have also read her columns in the Hill Times. Mo Amir is the creator and host of This Is Van Collar, a BC-focused culture and politics podcast, which has been in existence for more than four years. You can also check it out as a TV talk show on Check News. You've also heard Mo on CBC Radio's One on the Coast uh, with Gloria Macarena and he's a columnist for Vancouver is awesome as well. It's great to have the two of you back together. Welcome back to Real Talk. Erica, you first. You find out that that $10 lottery ticket purchase uh, made while you're filling your tank with gas or grabbing a quart of milk or whatever you're doing turns into a $1.34 billion windfall. What's the first couple of things you're going to do? Um... Honestly, I would probably travel like for the rest yeah. of your life. No, like I would definitely take a year and travel. Where would be yeah. your first destination? I've always wanted to go to Cape Town. Ooh, very cool. And then just go from there on yeah. your own timeline. And your Botswana is great. And then you make it up and then you unbelievable. You, know. you just do whatever the hell you want. Exactly. Mo. And then you come back and you buy a two bedroom house for a million dollars. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, in, or if you're in, where are you right now? Yeah. I mean, if you're in certain parts of I'm Ontario, in Ottawa. Yeah. Certain so, parts of yeah, BC. It's Three million. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because you know Ontario tax. <laughs> yeah, most most coming to us from the West Coast, so his one point three billion would probably be spent on half a duplex. Mo, is that? Yes. Really yeah, <laughs> yeah a, a nice loft at best, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, welcome back to the both of you. We're really excited to have you here, and, and we had uh, we had great audience response last night when we announced that awesome. the two of you were getting back together. Let's lead with the story that people are, and I don't know if maybe both of you are just going to roll your eyes so hard you get a migraine, but it, this probably. is what everybody's talking about at least for now in Canada the prime minister everybody knows the story in a hotel uh, in London the lobby bar two nights before the queen's funeral he's there singing queen bohemian rhapsody blah 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 some people are pissed about it some people think it's a complete non-issue erica is this a big deal is this not a big deal do you wish we weren't talking about this or do you demand we do okay so i have okay i have me a culpa to make okay because when I first read the story in the Daily Mail, on Apple News Plus, by the way, okay, I was like, it said he was drunk. It said all of these things that weren't true. And how it contextualized it was very wrong. So I am now considering the Daily Mail. My mother always said, called it the Daily Fail. Ah. Okay, and now I know why. <laughs> I will not take a Daily Mail piece for seriously unless it I have another source. So when the story actually came out later, Rachel Gilmore wrote um, a story for Global News. The context was there. He it was on Saturday. They were um, it was him and a, a few other a couple other dignitaries too, who were singing a song by Queen with a renowned, I think, Quebec singer, French yeah. singer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was just a little kind of rendition of something a little bit fun, maybe to, it just didn't read the same way. So when that story came out, I said, all right, I changed my mind about this. I'm now outraged. Let's move on. I'm not outraged. Let's move on. I think this is a non-story. Mo. Was he singing Fat Bottom Girls or, or was he singing, you know, Another One Bites the Dust? Like, then I can see maybe there being some issues. Uh, that would yeah, be epic. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, when it comes to dunking on the prime minister, I, I'm the first in line to do my best uh, Vince Carter impression. So I, I love, you know, having, having fun at his expense. But yeah, I was a little confused by the, the anger and the outrage <laughs> over this whole thing. Like, it seemed like he was just having fun at a, at a private function. And I, I think we're, as Canadians, we're almost attuned to observing his every move when he's overseas because, because he has embarrassed himself. But do I put this on the list of, you know, uh, Trudeau's embarrassments overseas? No, not really. And, and I don't understand why people are so 
bent out of shape. Yeah, there is that narrative, though, isn't there, that that the prime minister on, on several occasions, whether you're talking about some of the more controversial ones from a, from an optical perspective with regards to to corruption. Uh, and I know that that's a heavy word to use, but the, the Aga Khan's island and the, the chopper and that kind of stuff. There's obviously the trip to India wearing the, yeah. the culturally relevant and, and traditional garb and, and that upset a lot of people. And there was kind of that, that that assertion from his critics that Trudeau has been an embarrassment, that he's a little bit tone deaf, uh, that he has an, uh, maybe a certain inability to read a room. Now, I know his supporters could clap back with their own observations uh, in, in, in protest. But but Erica, is this one that you would add to that list? I guess what I'm asking you is by the time the next federal election comes around, is this the type of thing that will be trotted out as part of an attack ad? You think it'll have that staying power? No, because, you know, there'll be something else. <laughs> I mean, sure. by the time an election rolls around, I'm pretty sure. You know, it, it's funny to me that I don't think people got this upset over blackface. And that's where I have a problem. Huh. So, I mean, I could make a story out of it, but it's not the story that people would want to hear. You know, at the end of the day, what I initially thought was upset about is that so, for example, I just wrote a column in the Hill Times that came out today that basically said, I'm glad the queen is dead. And I know this is this is controversial and this is bad and this is and, you know, it, there is this there hasn't been a corner of diversity of thought around the queen in this country. And um, there's not a lot of naysayers who are allowed to get on media and say, you know what, she did some horrible, horrible things. And there hasn't been a lot of room for that. So, and the rest of us who have been saying historically relevant facts um, have heard um, nothing but tone policing and, um, and respectability politics about how, you know, all these rules about mourning the dead. And I'm over it. I'm not here for it. If you want me to mourn somebody, then somebody should, should actually do something properly in their lives. Hmm. especially people with power. So to me, I was more upset when I thought that he was drunk and belligerent or whatever the Daily Mail said. I thought to myself, why is it that we are being tone policed for our relevant um, points of view? And the prime minister gets to go over and, you know, act a fool. That was my initial thought. Now, now that I know he didn't go over an act of fool, that, that takes away my, my argument over it. <laughs> but the other thing, too, is that, hey, when we get more information and we get better information, we can change our minds, people. That's the other thing I want to say. So I'm glad the people on Twitter, my followers and stuff, gave me that space because I literally did a mea culpa. Yeah. Well, I mean, can I ask a question real quick? Like what if, what if the prime minister was drunk and, and, and all we saw was the same clip? Like, would that change the context of it? I, it wouldn't bother me. I mean, I would be more concerned if, if his behavior was off the wall or anything like that, because he is representing this country, but let's just say he was hammered and all we saw was that clip. Like, does that change the context or, or, or how we feel about it? I think it's more about, um, how we treat people in stations, right? So for example, I'm saying, hey, like I've gotten like people who have um, said, you know what? I have complex feelings about the queen. She's not relevant to me, frankly. You know, you know, if you're Kenyan, you have some good reasons to hate the queen. You know, if you talk about the Mau Mau rebellion, and as the queen was accepting her session in Kenya, British forces were torturing people, British colonial forces. Those, those issues are real. And what I find is that when those issues are brought up in Canada, in this context of the queen dying, those voices are told that this is not the right time, that we're being disrespectful to her memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I resent that. 
So flip it over. What would bother me is if the prime minister um, escaped those respectability politics when he should be respectable. That would be my argument, but he didn't. Mm. So, and so there's no issue with me. <laughs> Mo, what do you think? I mean, I mean, when it comes to the queen, I, I, I'm probably a little more moderate or I guess a little more mainstream on my opinion. You know, I, I do like the idea of when we commemorate someone or look back at someone's life, having that holistic view. I'm not going to be out here as a South Asian man to defend the, uh, the English monarchy. But at the same time, I think you can hold several things to be true, right? You can absolutely criticize an institution while also being respectful to just someone who's passed away, uh, while also holding the opinion that, you know, Prince Charles is probably going to do more <laughs> image damage to the, the royal family than, uh, than anyone has, except for maybe, I guess, Prince Andrew in, in the last little while. Like, I, I wonder how our feelings are going to change about um, the monarchy and, and, and the new king and, and all that. But I don't know. I, I do. It's, it's funny that I'm saying this, but yeah, I do kind of err on the side of res respectable politics or respectability politics, just when it comes to someone's passing and, and certainly someone's impact, which isn't necessarily all positive. And there's, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of gray and it's a lot of darkness too. Um, and, and I don't see the problem in that, but uh, I'm not going to be one of those people who's necessarily celebrating the death of, of the queen or, or of anyone really. Well, I appreciate that both of you are taking this up because I mean, there are, there are a lot of things and, and Erica, you, as if I need to tell you this, but there are so many different angles on, on the premise of what you're presenting. I mean, you even look at how demonstrators or, or protesters were handled um, outside Buckingham palace or in the city of London over the past number of days. And, and essentially unapologetically, uh, the mayor of London, London's top brass with regards to their law enforcement have said that, you know, we were getting ahead of a, I'm paraphrasing. We were getting ahead of a circumstance that the police in London may not have been able to manage. And so, I mean, protesters that were showing up with, I mean, depending on your perspective, either respectable enough or, or tepidly disrespectful placards were being arrested, being carted away, being taken away, being stifled. And, and in, a, in, a, in a country like England, uh, I think that that's cause for concern for a lot of people. And so, I mean, that's, that, that's one other angle on only, one that has a ton. It's not only that, it's that the UK government is actually moving to suppress protesting in, in, a, in, a, in a larger political. I mean, Alberta's country. is too, but yeah. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> but the point is, is that all of these, like, these are flashpoints for bigger issues. And um, I like to get to the bigger issue. Yeah. I'm grateful for it. Mo, if he was drunk, uh, you asked the question, but I don't remember you answering it. Would it change no. it for you? And I haven't answered it either for what it's worth, but what do you think? Uh, no, it wouldn't change it for me. If he was drunk and all we saw was the same clip, I mm. don't know if I would be bothered by that. Now, certainly if his behavior was off the wall, if he was, you know, uh, being super loud and obnoxious and aggressive, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah like if he, puked, on, on if he puked into the piano, then yeah. it would be different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm, you know, obviously, I think as as any representative of the country, certainly a prime minister, you have to represent yourself in a certain way. But based on the clip that we saw, like, I was still kind of, I get that people are going to make jokes, and that's fine. And, and I, I think that's fair game. But some of the anger I've seen and people saying disrespectful and all this other stuff, it's like, Come on, guys. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about here? Tracy's keeping us on our toes in the live chat. And she says, uh, Jesperson, thanks for mentioning that with Alberta. She says, keep in mind, Ontario also uh, legislation to suppress protesting. So it's something that needs to be discussed and talked about and uh, uh, appreciate that. In just a second, uh, Erica really didn't like, at least that's the sense I got from you, my friend, an email that I read here on the show a couple of days ago. <laughs> I hard <laughs> eye roll. Wondering, I wondering who was in the mushy middle and so we're going to tee that up in just a second. We're talking to Erica Eiffel and Mo Amir. This show happens because Athabasca University is here committed to conversations that matter to Canadians. Canadians from across this great land who trust Athabasca for their post-secondary experience, world-class accredited online programs and courses that offer flexibility to learn at your own pace, 
on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. That means if you need to take time off, something expected, like a lengthy family getaway, or maybe something unexpected, like illness or a family emergency, you'll never fall behind in your studies at Athabasca University because you dictate the pace. You can start the process today, learn more about their admissions, and search their thousands of programs, courses, and options at AthabascaU.ca. Our friends at Westworld Computers have their hands on the new iPhone 14 Pro. It is Pro Beyond, and it's now available at your Apple store. That is westworld.ca. It's your source for all things Apple. And, of course, they've got their MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs on sale right now. They're overstocked, and they know this is the time of year. Whether you're heading back to school or hitting the ground running with a new job, you may need to upgrade your computing power. People trust the MacBook Pro. People like me. People like John. We love them. And you can find them online or in person, westworld.ca. Local Environmental Services is providing waste management, recycling, and other solutions across Alberta and Saskatchewan. They've been doing it family-owned for a quarter century. I talked to Real Talker Graham just yesterday. Let me know he got one of those big front-load bins. Their family making a big move. They had to get rid of a ton of stuff. He went to localenvironmental.ca, got his quote, had the bin delivered to his door, told me it was painless, seamless, and a perfect fit. Don't forget Trash Talk coming up on Friday, presented by Local Environmental Services. We're hanging out with our unofficial opposition roundtable. It's Mo Amir and Erica Ifill. Uh, Erica, of course, uh, uh, both of you, a great follow on Twitter, but but I saw you from your account, Wicked Chick, just the other day, uh, taking issue with an email I'd read on the show asking about the mushy middle. Essentially, I, I, I had to I had to tag you because I was like, I'm not like I'm glad you did you. I'm glad you I did. Was like, oh, <laughs> But hey, the email resonated with a ton of people. Like a lot of people really enjoyed it. So what, and, and, and I can read excerpts of it in just a bit, but it, it's, it's essentially the premise of it, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, it's centrist politics. It's somebody saying they feel like the left swung too far left, the right swung too far right, and they're wondering who's with them in the so-called mushy middle. So yeah, what, I've always used that term as a pejorative, to be honest. I, I exactly. always find it not That's that good interesting. Reason. <laughs> yeah, and and it's like this idea of like, hey, do you do you like uh, pineapple on pizza? And and someone answering the question by saying, well, you know, sometimes pineapple on pizza is great, but sometimes it's not so good, and sometimes it depends on all these other factors and blah blah. And you're not even answering a question. You're not staking a position. And you know, I think in certainly in the media space or in the commentary space, I feel like there is an argument to be said. As I just made a mushy middle answer earlier in the show, but. There is a there is something to be said about if, if you're not willing to go too far, you will never go as far as you need to go. And this idea that like, absolutely, I'm all for compromise and talking to people, but we need voices from all sides, I think perhaps in respectful debate. And when I say respectful, again, I'm not talking about respectability politics, but I'm saying that Eric and I can sit here and have a heated argument and still yeah. be pals afterwards yeah. and not take it personally. And I love so, those friends. yeah. And if we, you know, if we curse at each other or whatever, it's all good because we're buds and we're not going to take things uh, personally or make it personal. And so this idea of like, everyone, let's just talk in a tepid voice and, and be boring. And, and this is how, you know, this is how society works. I just find it boring <laughs> more than anything. And Aaron. if you, if you, if you, what do you stand for? Exactly. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. If you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And the mushy middle is what brought us to this place in the first place. All these people who are who want to both sides everything are exactly why we're platforming the far right. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, I like this is my favorite MLK quote. Since we love to quote Martin Luther King, let me quote him. So in his letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963, he wrote, I have re almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the right moderate who is more devoted to order than justice. And that's the thing. 
the mushy middle isn't interested in justice. It's only interested in order. Right. And order without justice is a powder keg waiting to happen. Ryan, do you know, you know what another term for the mushy middle is? Mm. Status quo bullshit. That's yes. what it is. <laughs> See, I it's think, just yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, go no, ahead. I mean, I uh, I don't know why I'm standing in the way of this because you guys are throwing darts, but I just uh, like to me, it, it it strikes me as someone that was trying to build consensus, tr- someone that was trying to be reasonable, someone that was trying to find common ground, someone that was open to different perspectives and considering those perspectives in the we context where they're most relevant. Erica, <laughs> we went through that era. How many times did I hear? about about um we put how many times did i hear people say that when it comes to things like you know right right wing especially talking points that were just wrong okay that i should open up and listen to their views the views of people who question my own humanity it's ridiculous there's some things you cannot both sides and that is the material point i read i read the email and let me pick something out. Why do we think that nuance equals landing in the middle? Those two are not the same thing. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and I think, you know, it, Ryan, when you're talking about building consensus, absolutely. If you're in government, it is a battleship, right? And it, it takes degrees to turn things around. It, it's hard, short of, you know, actual revolution. You can't really pull a UE like you would on a scooter. But I think in the in the discourse, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about drug poisoning deaths and this idea of safe supply is one that is radical, but it one, it's one that needs to be pushed because you literally have, you know, in BC, six people dying a day and, and people wanting solutions now. And, and unless you have those voices that sure, maybe are not mainstream or maybe might seem uh, extreme to others, um, you know, we're not going to push forward any, any of this dialogue. And, and, you know, when you, you go through that email, like this person was really seemed to have a problem with being uncomfortable. And that's, I think what yes. worries me the most, like they don't like the term white privilege or something. And it's like, well, we should be talking about everyone's privilege or privileges that we all have in, in different degrees. Yeah. And some of these conversations, again, they can be uncomfortable without being personally disrespectful. And so this idea that we all have to tone it down, absolutely. Some people on Twitter need to tone it down. Some people, <laughs> you know, out, out there need to absolutely tone it down in terms of how they're treating other people and treating right. strangers. But this idea that we can't get heated and passionate and, you know, throw out wild ideas and talk about it, that is just weird to me. And I don't get it. And I just, again, status quo bullshit. Mm. Yeah, I... I love that you brought up comfort. That is exactly it. This person wants to be comfortable. And in times when you're being challenged in times of challenge, the last thing you should be is comfortable. I mean, we have some serious challenges in this country because if you're too comfortable, you're not a problem solver either. Hmm. For context, and if people go back, you just look, search through our podcast archives, uh, look through YouTube. It's just a couple of shows ago, and I read this email from Real Talker Catalina in its entirety. Um, she opens by essentially saying that, you know, hearing the word the, or the term woke uh, thrown around by new conservative leader Pierre Polyev in a pejorative way. Okay, said, let's talk about that word. Can we talk about that <laughs> word? I'm so sick of this, okay? Woke came around woke was hot in like 2014 2015 it came from the black community and it it was about it 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 had to do with black liberation it meant stay awake pay attention to what's going on around you pay attention to 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 um elections and and situations and issues in your neighbors and what's gerrymandering in the work and gerrymandering in the world around you and give a shit Right. That's literally what woke meant. Pay attention, stay awake. And it's been co-opted by, yeah, by by uh, a greater white community that has turned it into a pejorative term, like somehow social justice warrior is pejorative. And I'm just like, we're in an affordability crisis right now. I'm pretty sure you'd want some social justice. 
Yeah, and sadly, I think in the co-optation, uh, it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? It like doesn't. it's just a it's just a general blanket term for people, particularly on the right or I guess in the center as well, to you know call people on the left or who they perceive to be on the left uh, as stupid or dumb or whatever. But it, it's now, unfortunately, it, it, the term means nothing, and it's only used as an insult, right? Like, but but haven't all haven't no, all the terms? Uh, maybe I'll walk that back a little bit. But yeah. haven't a lot of the terms lost their meaning? Like like, what does fascist mean anymore? What what does Nazi mean anymore? What is, like with 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 the way right. that everyone's throwing around all the labels? Uh, what means and anything I, anymore? Do people have the depth of understanding to truly realize? the depth of meaning that they invoke when they throw these labels around Erica woke included. Well, that's why when you come up against somebody like me and I tell you that you're stupid, then, you know, don't, don't say anything because if you don't know the word, the meaning of the words that you're using, why are you using them? Fair. Let me read this little bit. Listen, if I were to put apoplectic in a sentence, I damn well would look that shit up. Okay. Before I put it in a sentence to make sure I'm using it correctly. Maybe it's me at some point. Okay. We have to be adults, you know, adulting. Like I, I, don't t- see the- I was reading a story right before I talked to you guys, right before we went on the air. I don't know if you saw this, this Bill Maher interview that he just did, but he, he uh, starts. Did you have, do you know what I'm about no, to say? But it's Bill Maher. And I just, oh. <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll let, let me just tee it up. And then you can just walk up to the tee box and hit it 350 yards down the fairway, Erica. But I, you know, Bill Maher, he's talking about his new podcast where he, he famously smokes, oh, smokes a joint. He and a- then, he, you know, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he says that he has real concerns that the Republicans will obviously get Give Donald Trump the nomination and that Trump will win. And he said that he thinks that Biden can beat Trump, but he's uh, worried that he won't. And he said that the Democrats should be able to run away with this. He says, but their woke far left politics are going to get in the way, says Bill Maher. It's time for the Democrats to stop talking about men who get pregnant. And so when you invoke that phrase woke, it gets people's attention. He then gives an example of where he thinks that the Democrats would lose the average American voter. And I think that that's how he's invoking Why? that phrase. Because that's the, the strategy American there. Vote. Look, I don't listen to anything Bill Maher says because at the end of the day, this is the man that used the word house N word. Okay. Yep. yep. So yeah, ever since then, right? And we talked about this on the podcast when it happened. So I remember this. Ever since then, I don't listen to anything he says because he's usually wrong. At the end of the day, um, the abortion issue is still there. Did he mention that? He didn't. Well, I, I didn't. I can't Whoa. say. I mean, it, there's See, there's, Bill a, is also, there's a note where it does say right at the very end, it says that this interview is edited for brevity. So, you know, maybe he did. I don't know. I mean, Bill Mars, Bill Mars, a guy that uh, platformed Milo Yiannopoulos and then Thank took you. credit and for, he for getting him canceled. Or, he yeah, did. And Mo, and he did again in that in this interview I'm talking about. I don't know if you've have you read it? It was just it was just I published. I think it was it, just no. published this morning. But yeah, he, he references that. And he, and he and he talks about how he's had Milo and, and Ann Coulter on his show as well. And, and he said, look what happened to Milo after he came on. He says he lost his book deal. He lost his you know global tour or whatever he was calling it at the time. Uh, he Bill said Maher that, some, was not that was not. Yeah, that wasn't because of Bill Maher. Exactly. Like, yeah. Where's he? <laughs> this is why I don't listen to this man. OK. I do not listen to him. And if you think that I'm just some, I know somebody's going to call me a woke leftist at some, at some point, here's a man from the quote unquote left who I also have problems with, to be honest, because if you've ever met a Bernie bro, ugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I think, but I think the tension that, that Bill Maher is highlighting maybe inadvertently is that there are some people in the political sphere or media sphere that their biggest concern is winning. And I can respect that to a certain degree, but to create this dichotomy of winning versus actually trying to make a change or trying to speak for your communities, um, I, I don't think that's fair. And I think any party, any big tent party, of, like has to incorporate, I don't wanna call it, I, like I wanna, I wanna use the term lightly, but they, but they have to incorporate some quote unquote radical elements because ultimately those are the people that are coming up with 
some of the innovative ideas or policy ideas or how we structure society or highlighting systemic biases, privileges, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, I, I think that ultimately these two sides, the, the side that wants to win politically and then the side that is coming up with new ideas, they do have to coexist. And so to pit them against each other, I, I don't know if it necessarily makes a lot of sense, but, you know, certainly for Bill Maher, it'll get claps from centrists, the mushy middle and uh, some people on the right. There's your mushy middle. Centrists in the mushy middle would be an amazing band name. Um, <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. Mo, let me let me circle back. And by the way, uh, we're yeah, doing yeah. this live, and and so I'll just ask you on air, so to speak. Uh, we asked you guys for like 20 minutes of your time, and we're way past that. Do either of you have a commitment? Oh, yeah. Do I have to let you go? Do you have a hard out? Can we go for another few minutes? No, I, we, I know we can go all day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The unofficial opposition has no rules, uh, which is amazing. No. If you're if you're just streaming now live on the Mixler audio app, this is Erica Ifill and Mo Amir. Uh, let me let me jump into the live chat here. Uh, Dwayne says, uh, you know, speaking of words that that may be invoked now or have people understood the magnet, blah blah blah. Uh, he says, sure, socialism existed 30 years ago. Yeah, it sure did. He says, but the word was never really used in Canada like it is now. Haas says meanings aren't lost; they evolve. The dictionary is a historical record not, not a evolved. rule it book was co-opted like come on so yeah. can it be taken yeah. back erica can the word like you you mentioned i'm so glad you mentioned social justice warrior because to me that's a badge of honor and and i think that i i i wear it well yeah you know and well if you're not a warrior for social justice like what the then fuck who are you, you even doing warrior for what are you even doing <laughs> but let me status ask quo, this, baby so who's what gonna is fight the for the status quo who is gonna, gonna fight, fight for the status quo <laughs> Yay! But Mo, you say, you know, Mo, you said, I want to circle back on something a while ago. You said if you're, uh, and and if I misquote you, please jump on me. But you said, if if you're not willing to go too far, you'll never go far enough. And I, and I wonder if maybe, and you've, you've earned the applause of Erica for the benefit of people listening on the podcast, but these days we look at how far people are willing to go in the name of their politics. And I wonder if maybe we need to take more pause now than we did before to endorse a message like that. I, I don't think that that mantra or that motto uh, condones violence or hatred or bigotry. Like there are absolutely limits to what I'm talking about. But the idea of going too far, you know, going back to circling back to where we're talking about respectability politics, if you're trying to hold someone accountable and you're you know badgering them for an answer, you know, is that disrespectful or is that going too far, but staying within the bounds of you know, not attacking that person personally, like there's still limits. Absolutely. I, I don't think I ever advocated for a limitless, um, you know, advocacy or activism or anything like that. But this idea that there are certain policy ideas out there that are going to make people uncomfortable. And unless you're willing to push it, unless you're willing to stand by it, you know, what we're just talking, we're just talking in a very narrow box. Um, so again, my, my point is expand the Overton window, but absolutely there are limits when it comes to safety and general respect and you know how you treat other people erica I like yeah to, i like to tell people that um <laughs> if we weren't radical there would still be slavery hmm. yeah and that's and that's and that's the point right like the, at the end of the it, day it was it yeah. was only it was only until people came up with quote unquote, the radical idea of, Oh, wait, maybe, maybe we're all equals, or maybe this institution of slavery is, is not good. Right. Like those were radical ideas. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Haitian revolution. Mm. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that you can, I I mean, I hesitate to like jump from this subject to that subject, (laughs) but uh, you know, we, and we've heard of the difference. I mean, we've had conversations on this show about it, about the difference between, uh, the difference between a radical and an extremist, right? Yes. And and when we talk about things like adequate climate policy, uh, it requires an element of of radical leadership. Uh, but I don't think that the general public or the status quo, if you will, is looking for extremism from their elected representatives when it comes to climate policy. There is a difference, right? Well, let me yeah. let me just say, like, um, I was talking to a friend about LBJ the other day. So uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, former President Johnson, who knew that by going through with civil rights, he knew he would lose the South. He knew 
that there would be a political price to be paid and he knew they would be paying it for a generation and he did the right thing anyway. That is the leadership we need. That is the leadership we do not have. And that is exactly going back to the queen, why I criticize her. You can at read- At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we all like moving towards inclusion and, and, and you know, and and equal rights how is that wrong when in history has that been a wrong decision hmm. okay i in your in that email this emailer then brought up J, J, um, sir john mcdonald and i was like here the we statues. go statues yeah the statues the statues yeah. here's the thing you get rid of a statue how is that how is that get how is that relegating somebody like erasing somebody from history you're just getting rid of the adornment mm -hmm. of that history not the history itself so if this person were really nuanced they would understand the difference but this person's not nuanced what they want is a return to the status quo that they grew up with that made them comfortable that's it that's what the mushy middle is and that is what the email writer expose themselves to be i encourage everybody right. to listen to the full email just to get the sense of it because there is a lot to it and 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 the the um the uh the the swerve near the end uh, talking about the sir johnny mcdonald statues across canada whether or not yeah. they should be torn down or had plaques installed um came a bit out of nowhere but 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 the beginning of the email starts saying Listen, I'm, I'm supportive of LGBTQ2S plus rights. Listen, I'm supportive of gay marriage in Canada. I'm supportive of this, 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 and this. Uh, but I'm feeling alienated, you know, called a racist by the hard left for the following. And, and then she develops her thoughts. So you can get the get the context there. Mo, you wanted to say something. I bet you nobody yeah. even called her a racist. I think she just <laughs> feels like she would be called a racist. I, 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 whenever people say that, I'm like, so who called you racist? And they're like, well, nobody. And I'm like, what do you? I don't understand what you're afraid of. I mean, I think that. Sorry, Mo. I. I'm oh no! Oh, please, please. This. I'm going to shut up after this. No, whatever. Um, no, no, no. Continue, please. I I believe that people can evolve. They can learn, and we should give them space to learn. That's something that I'm working on: is giving people space. This this in this learning process. I didn't have to learn what I know in public, for example. Um, so so I've gotten that sort of leeway. Um, I think, though, that one, if you're going to fight for comfort, then you don't want to learn. And that's my problem. If you want to fight for the mushy middle, then you don't want to to learn about about how LGBTQ rights um, and uh, you know, coincide with class or coincide with race or coincide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you don't want to open yourself up to that. And I think we should. Hmm. I think we should. I think we should learn about other people's struggles. We should learn about class struggles. We should learn about the history of class struggles. That's my next thing, mm -hmm. to learn about the history of class struggles, because there's just so much out there that has been done for us that we can learn from. And again, you're an adult. If you don't want to learn, I can't help you with that. Hmm. Dawn in the live chat says uh, she's always said they should paint the hands of a statue red if they have been responsible for deaths. I love that. And yeah. Tony it's replied. Like the Scarlet Letter. Tony, <laughs> sa Tony says that'd be a lot of red hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think it's funny. They're actually both bang on. Hey, b before we thank you both for your time, uh, I got to ask you about this, Mo. This is kind of an interesting yeah. situation out of Vancouver. Uh, yeah. Mayor Kennedy Stewart uh, running a slate, uh, which is a little bit, you know, some Canadian cities will see slates in municipal politics. Essentially, it's like a team, right? It's a it's like bringing it's a party. The part it's, a it's, party. it's a political yeah. party at a Montreal. municipal level. They did that in Montreal. Uh, you bet. Um, Kennedy Stewart and his wife, Jeanette Ash, uh, both running on the slate. Your thoughts on this? It's somewhat unique. Yeah, it is, it is very, it's very unique. And so in, in Vancouver, in the city of Vancouver, we do have political parties for our civic uh, election, at least in the city of Vancouver. And it is interesting, the current incumbent mayor, Mayor Kennedy Stewart, he used to be uh, an MP as well for the NDP. 
He is running for re-election and he won his original uh, election or the first election in 2018 as an independent. And this year he's coming out with his own political party, his own slate, and included in that slate, as you mentioned, is his wife. I like it. I'm a fan. I think that's great. Uh, I, I want to see more of that. And I, 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 I know people are going to you know, jump to nepotism and all this stuff, but it's like, uh, you know, couples work together all the time. I, I, and I, or not, I, I think we're not. Well, yeah, or not. that could be interesting. I just think own it. I, you know, if that's what you're doing, then that's your brand now. And you should, you should lean into it. I'm, I'm a fan of it. Um, and, and that's separate from my, my feelings about Kennedy himself, but I think it's great. Uh, but I'm sure many people think it's weird or that it would never work. Erica, do you like it? I don't know. I listen. I always say that we are a constitution, a constitutional oligarchy. So it fits. At least, at least, it's being honest about it. <laughs> Let the voters decide. I suppose. Let the debate begin. But this is a good. Um, this is a good example of maybe having a healthy debate around around the um, the nepotism in our industries, for example, media. Oh, the nepotism in media, my God. It's worse than politics. Give us an example. Uh, well, I, sorry, I, I just want to interject here, but, but when we're talking about like elections, and certainly there is nepotism, but it is slightly different because, you know, people do have a vote in terms of who they choose to vote in. So it is a slightly different than yeah, being yeah. appointed by your partner or by a family. Right, right, right. But I, I'm just like, I, I just think this is one of those things that let's talk about it. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure one way or the other. I'm not going to land on anything because let's hear the arguments. Yeah, Mo, I'm going to be honest. I just like we try to keep our eye on headlines across the country, and I saw that one. I was just like, oh, I'll just ask Mo about it. So I haven't done. Speaking of headlines, <laughs> I haven't done like a ton what's of. What's the latest but- in Alberta? Wait, what's the latest in Alberta? Oh, How's not Daniel? much. Just normal. You know? Just totally normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, everything's great in Alberta. Thanks for asking. Moving along to Saskatchewan, we take a look at the fertilizer limited. No, uh, okay, fine. So we'll make this a little bit longer, and I'll touch on this story. I was gonna, I was gonna run my mouth about it after I talked to you two, but but no, we'll talk. Let's run our okay, mouth okay, now. okay, okay. Let's do it now. I love you guys. Let's we'll talk it. about Casey Madu in just a second. But Mo, let me ask you this: cause, oh, because I haven't done the, I haven't done the, I haven't done the, the digging. I don't know. But is this? Do you yeah. think that this is a, a potential succession? Plan? Plan? Like, do you think that Mayor Stewart might maybe they like do a term together? She's a counselor, and then maybe she like. Do you think that maybe that's it? Is that maybe the idea or no? Uh, I don't think so. I, I haven't seen anything to point to that. Okay, uh, so no, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, it, it's funny because actually, I think Mayor Stewart's slate is a bit like his fan club. Like, so you have his wife, and then you also have his former campaign manager now running for council. Okay, and then you have a couple of people who were you know all, already kind of friends with him. So it, it's a weird slate in that sense. Like it is, it does seem like a bit of a, a family dinner party. But slates are kind of cool in that sense. Like you, you could you could get your curling team together and take like five wards. <laughs> <You're> just, <laughs> hey, we agree on a bunch of stuff, and we're gonna run a slate and see if it works. We'll talk. We, we don't have the wards. We don't have the ward system. So how does it? Work? It's just the no top idea. vote getters. Yeah. So the the top vote getter for mayor, obviously, and then the top ten vote getters. For that mayor. seems kind of nuts to me in the sense that like how do you how do you I mean I'm not going to say that politicians always represent their personal constituencies well I think that they do it best at a municipal level because they have no choice because when they're putting, <laughs> yeah, when, they're, they no when they're at the supermarket people are coming up to them and letting them know what they think <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that provincial or federal politicians do that great of a job looking out for their constituents own interests all the time but but what about let's say an area and and you know like let's say East Van or East Hastings or an area that may require you know a little bit more support more attention but if you got the top 10 vote getters and if those top 10 don't give a rip about East Hastings that's kind of detrimental to the whole system in the whole city, isn't it? It, yeah. I mean, that's the potential pitfall, and so that's why I think you see different candidates and different parties specifically targeting certain areas. Because yeah. when you have a municipal election where you know last uh, in 2018, last time the voter turnout was less than 40 percent, it's all about getting your people to the polls, like more than ever, like more than a, a federal or provincial election. It's like you need to make sure that your people go out, and so if you are, you know, representing things that people in East Van or Mount Pleasant care about more, 
you know, you're really going hard in those areas to make sure you, as many as many folks get the, uh, get to the polls as possible. I mean, in this current council that we have um, prior to this election, there does seem to be a little bit of representation uh, across the different neighborhoods. You kind of have, you know, the one councillor that's representing the uh, the, the rich uh, single family homeowners on the west side. Uh, you do have one councillor who's representing East Van. You have a few sort of in the middle. So it did work out, but uh, no, the potential for there to be just one neighborhood represented absolutely exists. All right. We'll talk about Alberta's former justice minister praising the Freedom Convoy in just a moment with our unofficial opposition roundtable. That's Mo Amir and Erica Ifill. You know, we talk about climate plans, you know, radical moves. What does yours look like? What's your sustainability goal? Does it include getting solar panels up on your roof? If it does, now's the best time in a long time to do it. Why? Because the feds have 40 grand interest-free upper grabs. It's the Canada Greener Homes Grant. You can learn more about it on the blog at kubienergy.ca. Kubi Renewable Energy providing solar energy solutions to power your life. And that includes doing all that nasty paperwork that comes with these government programs. You can get your free quote today from Jake and his team at kubienergy.ca. Now, once you've got solar on your roof in the summer months, you're probably going to be producing more juice than you need. That's yet another reason why you're going to want to take your business to Park Power. Electricity, natural gas, and internet is their game. A friendly local utilities provider that gives back to the community. And they're always trying to put more money in your pocket. So if you're selling your solar power back to Park Power, they're going to guaranteed pay you more than the big guys will. You can learn all the details under frequently asked questions at parkpower.ca. The promo code 2022-REALTALK gets you $70 off your first bill from Park Power. And if you're a bright, talented engineer, you know who you are. If you're sick and tired of what your employer is doing, the contracts they're landing, the clients you're working for, the... You're feeling this lack of motivation. We talked about boredom in the workplace yesterday. Apex Automation wants your talent on their team. Check out the careers link at apexautomation.ca. You can check out some of the exciting projects they're doing in some of Canada's biggest industries. Energy, brewing. Yeah, that's right. They're automating it all at apexautomation.ca. Hanging out with Mo Amir and Erica Eiffel every time we talk. It goes way longer than we anticipated, and neither uh, Erica, Mo, or, nor even myself will apologize for it. We just have too much fun, especially when news breaks. This one just last night from Minister Casey Maddu. He's Alberta's Minister of Labor and Immigration. Through a large part of the pandemic, he was Alberta's Justice Minister up until he called Edmonton's police chief to try to get off a distracted driving ticket. Well... Here he is the last night from his official Twitter account as CTV News announces that by the end of September, Ottawa is expected to drop COVID-19 vaccine border requirements and the Arrive Can app becoming optional. Minister Madhu says, quote, it was never about science, but about political control and power. Thanks to all those citizens, the freedom convoys who had the courage to mobilize against these tyrannical policies. They endured a lot of hate, name calling, suffered and vilified on behalf of all of us. I thank them, says Alberta's cabinet minister. Now, there's a lot to get into here, including the fact that provincial restrictions, I guess, would qualify as tyranny as well, which I guess would in a way make him a tyrant. But, uh, Mo, your first thought on this one from Casey Madhu. Focus group, is this a test for, you know, how this will affect Pierre Polyev in a federal election? Like, are they just kind of playing it out and seeing what the reaction will be? And maybe strategizing what he'll do later. Like, I, I don't know. It's weird to thank these folks. You'll never see, uh, you know, uh, a BC cabinet minister thank the Wet'suwet'en protesters or anything like that. I, the, the Freedom Convoy, you know, there can be a lot said about it. I, I think um, broad terms ne don't necessarily help anyone sort of understand it. But ultimately, we are talking about very disruptive protesters, certainly in Ottawa. We are talking about protesters that included very ugly elements. That don't, that's not to say that all of them were terrible people, but you know, the, the protest by and large did have some terrible elements in, and we saw that, you know, we saw the images. So I think to specifically name them, I think that's very conscious. And I just don't know if that, 
I, I don't live in Alberta, but I, I, I just don't know how that's good for anyone's optics or any political optics. Well, I think the, the most obvious point is that he's 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 pushing his chips to the middle of the table and he's all in on a Danielle Smith win for the UCP leadership race. I think he right. wants the nomination again in Edmonton he Southwest. Wants he, he wants a cabinet position. There position. You go. Right, yeah. Erica? Is, we talk about getting comfortable. Oh God, Cabinet's this man pretty comfortable. Is so thirsty. Oh, my gosh. This man is thirsty. <laughs> OK, he's so thirsty, but with, with like he's he should know about tyrannical power and issues about that, considering that he tried to bully the the what the Edmonton police chief into letting him off a ticket because he's Casey Madu, the 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 the, the minister of justice. And think about that relationship between the minister of justice and a police chief. Like, he should know about tyrannical... Like, come on, guy. Number one, he's thirsty. Number two, he's a hypocrite. And number three, that ratio on that tweet. No, he's getting Ooh, blown up. That tweet yeah. got ratio, Yeah. Which tells you it wasn't a good tweet. Because, as I recall, I recall a tweet in, ooh, September 13th, 2021. COVID is real. Families' lives have been shattered. Our healthcare workers have been doing indispensable work through the pandemic. Casey Madu. Like, dude, we know the wind is blowing in a different direction, and mm. you decided to be in the mushy middle. Oh, and let the wind take you to where it was. Oh, 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 the people in the mushy. You can't. Come on. That was like <laughs> Danielle Smith on this show uh, argued that she was a centrist. Uh, I don't know that I think that what Casey Madu is doing here qualifies as the mushy middle. Do you? But it's what they do. Is, they is do. it more like a, a windblown wafer? Yeah, <laughs> he's capricious. He is capricious. OK, and that is the material point. So why even listen to anything this bad says? Mm. I get it. You're about to be out of a job and you want to kiss up to your new employer your potential new employer. I get it. We see it. We see your thirst done, noted by. The Alberta NDP is running a really strong candidate in that riding next year, a guy by the name of Nathan Ipp. Um, off the top of my head, I think he's the vice chair of the Edmonton Public School Board, something like that, but like a, a strong community guy. And, Bye, Casey. Uh, Bye, yeah, Bo. Yeah, I Bye. mean, pe pe <laughs> people are sort of, and keep in mind, you know, for people that are going to be listening to this from, you know, your home provinces of BC and Ontario, of note, Minister. Uh, excuse me, my home province is what? Oh, we know. We love you here in Alberta. I'm just saying, I'm, you bring us that. You, you, hey, you're checking in from the freaking capital city you know like your nation's I live here we, okay i live here yes but, I live here. Hey, but, but, but proud my Albertan. fire is all albertan <laughs> yeah it is and i well, love it yeah but minister madu currently holds the only united conservative party seat in the entire city of edmonton so it is oh, wow. significant a loss in that riding would be huge and and you know i mean there's a lot of implications there that the three of us will discuss after that provincial election in 2023, Yay! it's going to be a fascinating one to watch. Absolutely adore the both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Make sure you check out everything that these two say, write, and maybe not do if it's around a piano at one o'clock in the morning in a hotel <laughs> bar. You can read Erica Ifill's piece uh, just published this morning at hilltimes.com. And of course, you can follow both of them on Twitter to learn more about what they do, including Mo's show on Twitter. Check. That's three check hosts in one week on the show, by the way. Right. Steel and Vance taking over just the other day. I <laughs> love the business model of what they're doing at check. Thanks to the both of you. Thank you so much, Ryan. You got it. That's Mo Amir and Erica. I feel Man, I just feel like you just buckle up for a conversation with them. And I love it. We do three hours next time. I think that thing just went for 60 minutes. I asked them for 20 <laughs> minutes. I really appreciate it. 20 minutes. We need a timer. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ding. Next. Topic. Ding. Yeah. Maybe one of those big hooks that used to come out on stage back in the day. And I could the, play like some some Oscar, you know, the, play the, the music, speech off. music, get off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I can't remember her name uh, in real life, but she just won an Emmy. Um, and um, she was known by many, many uh, Jennifer Coolidge. Yeah. And they were playing her off the stage. And she wouldn't with, have it. And she's like, no. It. She's like, no. It. This is once in a lifetime. And she started dancing along, too. Just it was kept great. going. Yeah. She's so great. Love it. Um, hey, with apologies to Ron and Carolyn, I'll tell you what. We'll read your emails tomorrow because we are uh, sort of up against the clock here in a way. No. 
actually, who cares? Why am I even saying that? Who cares? No, forget it. I'm going to read your emails. Why did I even do that? We don't know. What's the point of having your own podcast if you don't make exceptions to your time clock rules every once in a while? Right, John? Right? So what we'll do is why don't we head out to the mountains and then we'll read the emails from these two. Why don't we do that? Every Wednesday here on the show, thanks to our friends at Tourism Jasper, we have a chance to step away from the news cycle and uh, to just take in the beauty of the Rocky Mountains in Jasper National Park. We call it My Jasper Memories. And we're so thrilled to let you know that Jasper is open for business. Uh, people have been paying attention to the wildfire in and around that area for obvious reasons, but it's now safe to return and power is back. That means the local hotels and restaurants, tourism outfitters and other businesses are prepared to welcome those of you that may have had your travel plans interrupted. And it is a truly gorgeous time of year in Jasper. Right now, the leaves are just starting to turn, right? There, there's a dusting of snow on the peaks of the mountains, and it gives everything this extra kind of magical feeling. So here are some unique ideas of, of what you may do in Jasper this time of year. Uh, I mean, like, look at, geez, if you're watching on YouTube, the, the sky speaks for itself. Uh, they've got motorcycle tours, uh, heated jackets, cozy Harley Davidson sidecars. This is a thrilling activity. Even when temperatures dip, the tours run until October 15th. And so you still have time to hit the highway in what will be a forever remembered experience. Wildlife tours. You can spot animals in Jasper year round. The bull elk are getting extra animated this time of year, battling for dominance, the attention of those lady elk, right? A wildlife tour means you have a higher chance of spotting wildlife. Also keeps you safe as animals can be quite unpredictable during this time, right? The rut. How about indigenous fireside storytelling? An unforgettable evening with indigenous storyteller, singer, and drummer Matricia Brown. We featured her in a past episode of My Jasper Memories. She performs for small, intimate groups, answers questions about her culture and the history of indigenous peoples in this region. There's also food tours that you're going to want to know about. You can get a hearty dish and beverage at four different Jasper restaurants while learning local stories, right? Insider histories from a guide at Jasper food tours. And then of course the perennial favorites like fall hiking. And of course that shoulder season camping, which is a little bit of a different experience, a marvelous one canoeing, biking, you name it. If you're planning on visiting next month, don't miss the Jasper Dark Sky Festival. That runs October 14th through the 23rd. You can celebrate the wonder of the universe with celebrities in the world of space, science, arts, and culture. You can check out details on everything we just mentioned, plus more by visiting jasper.travel. Make your own My Jasper Memories. And when you do, on Instagram, on Twitter, Make sure you use the hashtags MyJasper and RealTalkRJ. You may see your memories featured in a future edition of My Jasper Memories every Wednesday right here on Real Talk. So Carolyn writes into the show and, and she says uh, in the context of, quote, Justin and the piano, this is the subject line. Queen Elizabeth uh, was widely known for her wry sense of humor and her lighthearted nature with her, her skit with Paddington Bear and James Bond being two great examples. I have to think she probably would have joined in on the song sung by Justin Trudeau. People forget that the Queen has known him since he was a little boy, arguably longer than any other head of state that attended the funeral. Justin Trudeau has buried his father and his brother. He's quite aware of how to behave when someone you have had a lifelong relationship with has passed away. Carolyn says, by the way, a a podcast suggestion for you, a future one, maybe a future interview. Adnan Syed from that serial podcast just had his sentence vacated, says, I'd love for you to interview somebody who has some insight on how the courts and law enforcement have screwed this up so badly. Carolyn, we love it when people write into the show with suggestions like this. Want to let you know we we do have an ask in with the host of the serial podcast with Sarah Koenig. Uh, We're hoping to work with her team to make that interview happen. And if not, that's something we'll talk about in future. We did tackle it in today's edition, today's episode of Seriously, our new podcast, Sapria Devetti and myself. And you can subscribe to that anywhere you get your podcast. You'll find it on YouTube as well. Ron wrote in uh, to talk at Ryan Jesperson com says Jespo and crew uh, Justin Trudeau has rightfully deserved the negative press for a lot of poor judgments over the course of his prime ministership but let's not nail him to the cross for letting his proverbial hair down 
and letting loose. It reminds me of the time the Canadian press got mad at him for sneaking a chocolate bar into the House of Commons during a particularly long session. He says that seriously happened. People should look it up. Ron says, I'm not embarrassed one bit. If anything, I'd love to see more of this from our leaders in Ottawa. Every single one of them is so sickeningly uptight and none seem normal. And knowing how politicians in Ottawa are, Trudeau will probably come out with some sort of a statement apologizing for letting loose. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Has your opinion changed on this, John, over the last 24 hours? Has the rage machine got to you at all? It hasn't. I'm hoping tomorrow we stop talking about this topic. Not that I didn't like exploring it today, especially with the unofficial opposition. Why don't we I, make, I think it's a non-issue. Should we it's make an official promise right now? No more talking about Justin at the piano? <laughs> Unless we book the prime minister to talk about singing around the piano, then we'll bring it back up. How does Unless that sound? Unless another politician goes on stage and does something musical, and then we'll do a whole, we'll do a whole montage. Harper, Trudeau, whoever else... I, I'm sure Pouliev has some. Has I'd like some to pipes. see what Pierre Pouliev would <laughs> sing at karaoke. I wonder what it might be. He would sing "Keep on Rocking" in the free world, most likely. Yeah. Neil okay. Young. Nice, nice Canadian <laughs> selection there. Good can con there. Yeah, I like that. Something with freedom in the title. Yeah. Hey, do you have your plans figured out yet for uh, this Thanksgiving? If not, I mean, you know, you know, you want to spend time with your family, right? Uh, you know, you want that to be quality time, uninterrupted by. I don't know, standing over your oven and trying to keep the sweat from your forehead from dropping into the mashed potatoes. I know that's disgusting, but you've been there, right? I have. Why not leave it to our friends at Friesen Brothers? The, they're now taking orders for their Thanksgiving dinner box, and that includes, of course, roasted turkey that's cured overnight. They cook it low and slow. It'll melt off your fork. We guarantee it. Baked potatoes with all the fixins, roasted root veg, gravy, cranberry sauce, their famous sourdough dinner buns, plus add-ons like Granny's stuffing, which I recommend and a four-pack of Bald Mike's beer if you're in uh, Edmonton or Fort Saskatchewan. You can order online right now at Friesen.com. I love the pricing of it. It's very affordable for four people, but, of course, you don't have to limit your order to four people. You know what I'm saying? If you want to order it for four people or 40 people, Friesen Brothers can make it happen. You can order it 60 bucks. Feeds four people. Are you kidding me? None of the work, all of the praise... When you leave your Thanksgiving plans to our friends at Friesen Brothers. And for those of you that are looking for a new vehicle, you're shopping for maybe something smaller, more fuel efficient, or maybe something bigger that can pull or carry more. Our friends at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge guarantee they will find you the ride that is the best fit for you. Let them help you get into your dream car. You can get approved right now online, shop their new and used inventory, even find out details on financing, or of course, you can go see them in person at their beautiful dealerships. You make sure you let them know that Real Talk sent you. That's our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Uh, coming up uh, on tomorrow's Real Talk, we're going to learn a little bit more about an initiative called daughter's day what's this all about it's of course a celebration of women making big impacts in their communities and, and we're going to talk to some of the straws that stir the drink so to speak and don't forget our friday real talk round table will be anchored by science journalist Anne Castleman. Really looking forward to this. She's done a deep dive for the walrus on what the UK is doing to win the race against climate change. What can Canada do better? That's coming up on Friday. See ya. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.